Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. My name is Chris, and tonight I will be your guide as we travel to the rainy streets of England to solve mysteries with Agatha Christie. We'll learn about her intricate, mysterious life and hear about her journey to become one of the world's leading best-selling authors. Before we begin, however, let us take a moment to unwind and find comfort in the space that we're in here and now. Close your eyes and allow your body to sink into the mattress beneath you. For a brief moment, turn your attention to how wonderful it feels to simply be lying in bed right now. Notice how your legs feel against the sheets, how your head feels as it sinks into the pillow, how much lighter your whole body feels as you sink deeper and deeper still into the soft, plush bed beneath you. Here and now, you have no obligations. By closing your eyes and listening to the sound of my voice, you are already resting and relaxing, and in time, as we journey to the rain-swept streets and lush scenes of rural England, you'll find yourself relaxing more and more. With your eyes still closed and your body in a comfortable position, I want you to try and imagine your bedroom is somewhere else in the world. It's a cool summer night, and your windows are wide open. In the distance, you can hear the sound of crickets chirping, filling that soothing air with their beautiful music. You pay attention to the smooth rhythm of it, to the length of the silence in between their chirps. And soon, in that silence, the soft croaks of frogs begin to pipe up. You can practically see the frogs nestled on their lily pads underneath arched stone bridges. The stars are reflected in the slow-moving water all around them, creating a beautiful, picture-perfect scene. The sound of the crickets and the frogs is a truly soothing melody, lulling you closer and closer to sleep with each passing moment. You picture the crickets curled up in the grass, in wildflower-filled meadows near the frogs. And then, the sound begins to change slightly. The cricket's chirping slows and slows until it is no longer. But the frogs begin to croak a little louder. Their song seems happier now, filling the air with their unique little call of joy. And, when you really listen, you understand why. You can hear the sound of rain pitter-pattering against the cobblestone streets. At first, they are light, soft drops of rain, as if the sky hasn't quite decided whether it wants to unleash the rain or not. But, gradually, The sound of the rain grows and grows. You can hear the plink as it rings off of metal roofs and buckets, 
you hear the soft thud as it dances its way across leaves and blades of grass and the rose bushes in your front yard. You hear it really pick up on the cobblestone, pooling into neat little puddles that make the sound of the rain echo further and further. It continues on until it is a steady drone beneath all the other sounds. And with the rain comes the smell of the atmosphere, of the earth, of the familiar petrichor. You can smell the dewy blades of grass the crickets were once chirping under. You find yourself breathing in the sweet, earthy aroma of the soil in the well-cared-for garden. And, mixed with those beautiful, natural scents, you can smell fresh bread cooking somewhere. The warm scent floods the rain-soaked streets, reminding everyone that comfort can be found even in the rainiest of nights, on the darkest of streets. You hear a carriage trudge on by, splashing puddles and steadily thumping its way down the road. You wonder where the people are off to, perhaps to the port down by the ocean, or perhaps they're going further inland to the forests and moors that can be found there. It is a vibrant environment you are in, a soothing and encouraging one in Torquay, England, at a cozy Victorian mansion named Ashfield. It is here that Agatha Christie grew up. Agatha Christie was born Agatha Mary Clarissa Miller on the 15th of September, 1890. Her father, Frederick Alva Miller, was viewed highly by many members of the community, as was her mother, Clarissa Margaret Miller Ney Bomer. Her parents were a wealthy, upper-middle-class family who called the town of Torquay home. Torquay is situated in Devon, southwest England. It is a seaside town with mild waters that are perfect for fishing and sailing. For much of history, Torquay was a town that survived on fishing and agriculture. Fishers would start their mornings early by setting out into the calm, even harbor, greeting the sun as it made its way across the ocean, painting it with all shades of orange, pink, and red. Meanwhile, beyond the hills surrounding the water, farmers would get to work making a life for themselves and their family on the fertile soil. The fine forests crisscrossing the beautiful town were perfect for adventuring and playing, for getting lost and going hunting in. Indeed, the land here provided its residents with a beauty bounty year-round. But, as the Victorian era swept across England, people around the world began to see the full potential of the town. It is not just a town of bounty, it's a town of beauty. Stunning rocky cliffs lace the coastline, moss blankets the stone that rises up 
out of the cerulean sea, creating a stunning contrast that is simply hard to ignore. In the Victorian era, the town became famous for being a seaside resort town. People flocked to what many called the English Riviera, and the town flourished with this influx of tourists. It was a town that people wanted to live in, and it was the town that Agatha and her family called home. Agatha's father was a stockbroker, and her mother was the daughter of an army officer. She had two older siblings, Margaret and Louis. By the time Agatha was born, they had settled into Ashfield in Torquay, a stunning Victorian home, which Agatha frequently wrote about and reflected on as an adult. In her biography, Agatha reminisced about the beauty of her home. I remember. I remember the house where I was born. I go back to that always in my mind. Ashfield. How much that means. When I dream, I hardly ever dream of Greenway or Winterbrook. It is always Ashfield, the old familiar setting where one's life first functioned. How well I know every detail there. The frayed red curtain leading to the kitchen. The sunflower brass fender in the hall grate. The turkey carpet on the stairs. The big shabby schoolroom with its dark blue and gold embossed wallpaper. And it's with good reason that she remembers the estate and the long, winding carriage drive from the main road, which would lace through the stunning gardens on the property. The other homes around were also Victorian, set on a few acres of land each full of their own character and flair that made the neighborhood feel safe and luxurious. The home had a greenhouse that looked out over the stunning garden. Agatha was fond of sitting there and looking out over the garden. But the garden by the kitchen in particular was a favorite of hers. From there, she would harvest green apples and raspberries, which she ate with abandon as she read or wrote or played make-believe in other areas of the house. Agatha had a home life that was truly supportive. Not only did she have two parents who adored her, but she had a nanny, whom she affectionately referred to as Nursey. The nursery in Ashfield is where her nanny would tend to Agatha with loving care. Even into her adulthood, she fondly remembered the atmosphere in that room. At times, she would lie in bed for hours, peacefully drifting between sleep and being awake, enjoying the medley of tranquil sounds coming from the gardens outside. The chirp of the crickets nestled beneath the leaves, the croak of the frogs in the creek that laced through the countryside and around the cobblestone streets. Making its way down the stunning marina that people would travel from all over England just to see. The sound of the rain dancing its way across the lush garden just outside her window. We can almost see her lying in bed, breathing in the sweet aroma that came with the rain. 
the smell of the apple tree just outside the window. Its cinnamony bark drenched with the cool rain. The raspberries ripe on the vine, with dewdrops clinging to them and weighing down the bushes, urging them closer and closer toward the rain-coated ground and the carriages in the streets, people on vacation splashing through puddles on their way down to the ocean, farmers riding their horses up over the hill, heading back to their fields after a successful day in town, selling the bounty of their harvest, or the fishermen trudging through the rain in their yellow boots to head down to the market. As a child, Agatha would lie in her bed, surrounded by lush gardens and sounds of the outside world. While Mercy, her nanny, would tend to her, flickering the oil lamps and preparing for their nighttime ritual. For hours, sometimes, Agatha would listen to Mercy read to her as she looked up at the lavish, beautiful wallpaper that stretched all the way up to the ceiling. It was a wallpaper of mauve irises climbing up to the ceiling in an endless pattern. Some days, Mercy's oil lamp would create fantastical shadows and creatures that danced across the walls and ceiling of her room. But other days, days where the rain brought the dampness inside, it would be a glow a totally different light, the light of the fireplace, filling the room with warmth and comfort. That would make the mauve irises pop and shimmer as the light danced across the wall, as the fire spread from log to log, filling the room with the sweet, comforting, piney aroma of the burning kindling. And it wasn't just Mercy that was there to help Agatha. There was also Jane, the cook, Agatha remarked as an adult. One other person of importance in the house was Jane, our cook, who ruled the kitchen with a calm superiority of a queen. She came to my mother when she was a slim girl of 19, promoted from being a kitchen maid, Jane cooked five course dinners for seven or eight people as a matter of daily routine. For grand dinner parties of 12 or more, each contained alternatives, two soups, two fish courses, etc. It's safe to say the meals that were served in the dining room on the ground floor were well beloved by the family, including Agatha. Unfortunately for Agatha, she would spend much more time with the adults in her life than other children. Her siblings were much older than she was, and their vibrant neighborhood had very few children in it which meant that the majority of Agatha's time was spent playing with imaginary friends in imaginary worlds or with her pets. And it's rather strange to think the young girl running through that garden in Torquay, making up stories in her head and acting them out with imaginary friends, was just practicing what would one day make her a household name. And she sat under the beech tree, eating various nuts and berries after a long day of play. She certainly had no idea what kind of future awaited her. 
what her destiny was. And her parents had no idea either. Her mother, Clara, was actually determined that Agatha should not learn to read until she was eight years old. However, Agatha was a curious girl, and the schoolroom and library in her home were practically overflowing with books. She began to read by herself at the age of four, and that's when the real magic began to happen. Her parents decided to homeschool her in the lovely little schoolroom with blue and gold wallpaper. Wallpaper that would flicker in the light of the fireplace that was lit on cold, foggy mornings. It's so peaceful to imagine Agatha sitting at her desk there, warming herself in the glow of the stunning fire and looking out over the rain-peppered garden as she opened a book for the first time. From an early age, she loved to read. She adored children's books by Mrs. Molesworth and Edith Nesbitt. As she matured and her reading level improved, she moved on to Lewis Carroll, then Charles Dickens, then Alexandre Dumas. In between the reading, Agatha's mother and sister taught her arithmetic and music, including how to play the piano and the mandolin. The sound of her playing the piano would radiate through the halls of Ashfield, filling them with a sense of serenity and youthful joy. When Agatha turned ten, she wrote her very first poem. It's remarkable to think that her mother wanted her to wait until she was eight to learn how to read. But at ten, she was already writing poems that were well beyond her age. Her first poem, The Cowslip, was probably written in that classroom in her home, in that private study by the fire where she could pause to look out over the garden to find inspiration as she penned. There once was a little cowslip and a pretty flower too, but yet she cried and fretted all for a robe of blue. Now a merry little fairy who loved a trick to play just changed into a nightshade, that flower without delay. The silly little nightshade thought her life a dream of bliss, yet she wondered why the butterfly came not to give his kiss. And thus, her love of writing was born. But things could not remain roses and butterflies for Agatha. When she was eleven, Her father passed away from pneumonia and chronic kidney disease. As an adult, Agatha considered this the end of her childhood. As a result of her father's passing, the family found themselves in a more challenging financial position. Agatha's siblings left Ashfield, which meant that only Agatha and her mother remained. The next few years were years of trial and error, years of struggle, years of searching. Agatha tried to attend a school for girls, but soon learned that she lacked the discipline. Eventually, she was sent to Paris to attend several boarding schools where she could focus on piano and singing. For quite some time, She dreamt of being a concert pianist, or perhaps becoming an opera singer. But after some time trying to make it in that challenging world, 
it became clear that she didn't have the talent, and she returned to England. By this time, her mother was fairly ill. Wanting to care for her, they decided to spend the winter in Cairo, Egypt, where they could enjoy the warm weather and social functions that the city had to offer. It was a happy few months there, of soaking in the sun, visiting the pyramids, and attending dances. After returning to England, Agatha truly began to focus on her writing for the first time. She wrote her first short story at just 18, titled The House of Beauty. From there, Agatha began to dive further into what she enjoyed in writing. Many of her first stories revolved around the paranormal and spiritualism. Though she enjoyed writing them, whenever she submitted them to magazines, they were unfortunately rejected. After her short stories, she began to pen full novels. Her first attempted novel, Snow Upon the Desert, was rejected by six publishing companies and also rejected by a potential literary manager. And while these losses were a bit of a hit to her spirit, they did not slow Agatha down. Her life was full of new developments during this time, and it wasn't just about her writing. In October 1912, Agatha was introduced to Archibald Archie Christie at a dance. Archie was a royal artillery officer who was charming and immediately swept young Agatha off her feet. Only three months after they first met, he proposed marriage to Agatha, who enthusiastically accepted. However, the world was unfortunately far from calm at this point in time. World War I was on the horizon, and when it broke out, Archie was sent to fight in France, leaving Agatha behind. But Agatha did not just sit at home waiting for her husband to return from war. Though she was a woman of wealth, and fairly high social standing. She volunteered as a member of the Voluntary Aid Detachment of the Red Cross. She worked diligently as a nurse, then a dispenser, and later as an apothecary's assistant, a job which would greatly help her understand use of different substances, poisons, and medicines in writing her mystery novels later in life. Once more, it's hard to imagine that one little life experience could have such a profound effect on her. Puttering around the apothecary, sorting herbs and medicine, looking out the window into the rain on occasion, dreaming about the love of her life coming home, dreaming that one day, one of her books would be published, dreaming of her mother reading her short stories in a magazine, or a published work. But it wasn't just her time working as an apothecary's assistant that would inform her future novels. It was the people she met while she was volunteering in general. While serving, she treated many Belgian refugees that lived in Torquay. These individuals and their stories would inspire the protagonist of her very first published novel, The Mysterious Affair at Styles. The protagonist featured in the novel, Hercule Poirot, took refuge in England 
after his homeland of Belgium was invaded. As the war ended, Archie came home to England, and they lived in a small rented apartment in London. At that time, she finally found a publisher for The Mysterious Affair at Styles, which was first in print in 1920. Agatha went on to have her first and only child, a beautiful and bright girl named Rosalind Margaret Clarissa. Around the birth and first few years of Rosalind's life, Agatha settled into writing more and more. She had two more novels published, The Secret Adversary and The Murder on the Links. From that point forward, Agatha's days of struggling to find people willing to publish her novel were over. She was a respected writer. Only she didn't know how truly respected she would become. In 1922, Agatha's worldview was expanded even more. She was able to travel for 10 months on a promotional tour for the British Empire Exhibition. This journey took her and Archie to places they had only dreamt about. South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii, and Canada. They traveled along the coastline of Australia. They became some of the first people from England ever to surf standing up in Hawaii. After their wonderful 10-month journey, they settled back into their home in England. Agatha got to work, writing harder than she ever had before. And Archie went back to work as well. They bought a house that they named Styles, after the mansion in Agatha's very first novel that had led to her success. But things could not be so joyful forever. In April of 1926, Agatha's beloved mother passed away. Her and her mother had a bond unlike any other, and the loss deeply, deeply depressed Agatha. She removed herself from her daily life and disappeared to a seaside village in southwestern France to help herself make it through the emotional fallout after the loss of such a beloved figure in her life. Though she cited it as burnout from overwork, it's understandable she would need time to recuperate out of the public eye, away from things she was familiar with. But, unfortunately, the bad luck did not stop there for Agatha. In August of 1926, Archie approached Agatha and told her he would like a divorce. He had caught the eye of another woman, and he had fallen in love with her. On December 3rd, Archie planned to spend the weekend with friends without Agatha. This distraught Agatha, and quickly an argument ensued. In the evening, Agatha disappeared from the home that was named after her first mystery novel. It was without warning, with no letter, without any conversation taking place about her plans. Her car was found the next morning, parked above a chalk quarry. There were clothes inside, but no sign of Agatha herself. When her husband discovered her missing, 
it quickly became a news story that spread like wildfire. The most famous mystery writer, going missing in a tale that seemed to mirror the ones she wrote about, caught the public's attention in a big way. More than a thousand police officers, 15,000 volunteers, and several airplanes searched the rural landscape for her. Even Sir Arthur Conan Doyle got involved by asking a spirit medium to find her using one of Christie's gloves. Soon, she was splashed across the cover of the New York Times. But she wouldn't be found near the chalk mine. Ten days after she went missing, she was instead found about 200 miles north of her home in a hotel in Harrogate, Yorkshire. She was registered at the hotel under the name of her husband's lover. After being discovered, she journeyed to her sister's home, where she requested the phones be shut off and anyone interested in talking be turned away. Christie never spoke of her disappearance. Some believe that she was suffering from a fugue state brought on by extreme stress. Others believe she was trying to frame her husband for her murder, like her sensational novels. And others simply believe that she wanted to disappear for just a little while. Agatha divorced her husband and continued to write and travel for the rest of her life. In 1928, she traveled aboard the Orient Express, first to Istanbul and then to Baghdad, which inspired her famous novel, Murder on the Orient Express. In Iraq, she met Max Malawan, an archaeologist, and the two quickly fell in love. She joined him on digs in the Middle East, which informed many of her novels and made her fall madly in love with the region and its various cultures. In her later life, it wasn't just her novels that she was known and revered for. She was an avid gardener who won several prizes for horticulture. She frequently brought furniture to rearrange and decorate houses. During her life, she received many accolades and titles. In 1971, she was promoted to Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire. Three years after her husband had been knighted for his archaeological work, she was the co-president of the Detection Club, a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, and was awarded with an honorary doctorate of literature. But, above all, Agatha Christie was a woman who remained curious about the world. When she was four, she began reading because she was curious she traveled around the world with her vivid imagination, taking it all in with hope and excitement. When she was asked to describe herself, she didn't speak often about her writing or her accomplishments. In 1946, she remarked, My chief dislikes are crowds, loud noises, gramophones, and cinemas. I dislike the taste of alcohol and do not like smoking. I do like sun, sea, flowers, traveling, strange foods, sports, concerts, theaters, pianos, and doing embroidery. To this day, people read Agatha's works around the world. She was a woman 
who showed the world the power of mysteries, the power of storytelling, and her name will forever be wrapped in mysteries, both the mysteries of her life and the mysteries that she crafted for the world to solve. I hope you have enjoyed this story, and it has brought you a night of peaceful, relaxing sleep. Hopefully, you can step away from this video with more knowledge of Agatha Christie and her remarkable life. Please, join me again tomorrow night for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams.